Picture this, the year 2000, the dawn of a new millennium, and technology stocks are all the rage. The internet was no longer a novelty, it was rapidly transforming into a necessity. With the promise of a digital future, investors were eager to pour money into anything with a dot-com in its name. This was the era of the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble was not just about technology, it was about speculation, about high expectations, about the belief that technology stocks could only go up. Investors were gripped by a feverish optimism, a collective belief that we were on the brink of a new era where traditional metrics of company valuation no longer applied. The hype was infectious, the optimism intoxicating. But here's the thing about bubbles, they're fragile, and this one was no exception. The tech companies had sky-high valuations, but many of them weren't making any profit. When earnings growth fell short of the lofty expectations, reality started to sink in. Investors realized that the dot-com at the end of a company's name did not guarantee success. Panic ensued, and then, the bubble burst. The Nasdaq, home to many of these tech companies, plummeted over 75%. Over $5 trillion in wealth was wiped out. Companies that were once darlings of the market were now worth pennies on the dollar. The digital future, it seemed, was not as profitable as everyone had hoped. And just like that, the dot-com bubble had burst, leaving a trail of financial devastation in its wake. In the wake of the dot-com bubble, the markets rebounded, but not everything was as it seemed. Beneath the surface, a number of structural issues lurked, like the proverbial monster under the bed. On Wall Street, risky behavior was the order of the day. Traders, investors, and financial institutions were caught up in a whirlwind of speculation and overconfidence. This led to an increasing disregard for traditional investment principles, as everyone sought to make a quick buck. The phrase, too big to fail, became a common refrain, lulling the market into a false sense of security. Meanwhile, another bubble was growing, this time in the housing sector. This was not just any bubble, but a gargantuan one, filled with the hot air of subprime mortgages and risky lending practices. Home prices soared to astronomical levels, fueled by low interest rates and lax lending standards. The American dream of owning a home became a reality for many, even those who could not necessarily afford it. However, like all bubbles, this one too had to burst. And when it did, in 2005, the fallout was nothing short of catastrophic. The housing market collapsed, leaving millions of homeowners underwater on their mortgages. Financial institutions were left holding the bag, with billions of dollars in bad loans on their books. The domino effect was swift and brutal. Major financial firms toppled, one after the other, triggering a global financial panic. The market plummeted, wiping out over $11 trillion in market value and costing 8.7 million jobs. And so, the stage was set for the next financial disaster, the subprime crisis. Fast forward to 2008, and the world is in the grip of a global financial crisis. An eerie echo of the dot-com bubbles burst, this time, the catastrophe was of a larger magnitude, sweeping across the globe and sending shockwaves through the world economy. The housing bubble had burst in 2005, but the full impact was yet to be felt. By 2008, the dominoes began to topple. Major financial firms, which had indulged in risky behaviors, were on the brink of collapse. With the likes of Lehman Brothers filing for bankruptcy, it seemed as though Wall Street was imploding. The panic was not confined to the financial district of New York. It spread across the country and around the globe, shaking the very foundations of the global economy. The US stock market took a severe hit. In a dizzying plummet, it lost over 54% of its value. This was not just a number game. Real wealth was wiped out, to the tune of over $11 trillion. The human cost was equally staggering. The crisis cost 8.7 million Americans their jobs. Unemployment soared, and the American dream seemed to be slipping away from the grasp of many. People lost their homes, their savings, and in many cases, their hope. The subprime crisis was not just about numbers. It was about people, businesses, and economies. It was about the failure of systems, and the need for better regulation and oversight. And above all, 
It was a stark reminder of the interconnectedness of our global economy. The subprime crisis had thrust the world into a financial turmoil unlike any other. The aftermath was harsh, with a slow and painstaking recovery. But as we will see in our next scene, it also brought about important lessons and changes. In the aftermath of such financial devastation, it was time to take stock and learn from our mistakes. The decade from 2000 to 2009 taught us valuable lessons. It showed us the high price of unsustainable debt and risky behaviors, and it underscored the need for vigilant regulation. We realized that prosperity should not be pursued at the expense of equity and stability. We saw the importance of maintaining a balance, of ensuring that not only the markets thrive, but that the benefits are shared by all, not just a select few. In response to these lessons, 2010 saw the implementation of strict reforms. These were aimed at managing the risks inherent in our complex financial system and preventing a repeat of the past. Yet we must not rest on our laurels. The work is ongoing. The vigilance must be constant. As we look back on the decade from 2000 to 2009, we see a time of financial turbulence, but also a time of learning and growth. It's a reminder that even in the face of crisis, there's always a way forward.